the Human Optimization Podcast is proudly brought to you by Vicon Supplements, where quality meets sustainability. Vicon's all-natural supplements are handcrafted and sustainably produced in Canada, bringing you products that nourish both your well-being and our planet. Visit ViconSupplements.com today and be a part of a greener, healthier future. Are you ready to embark on a journey to the best version of you? Join me, Lisa Patel-Killa, as I dive deep into the world of hair tissue mineral analysis and functional medicine with fellow experts and guide you on the path of unlocking your full potential. As a multi-time kettlebell sport world champion, I'm on a mission to reach high performance professionals from around the world to help you minimize tiring symptoms, maximize health and gain unstoppable energy. This is the Human Optimization Podcast. Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Human Optimization Podcast. I am Lisa Patel-Killy, your host, and I have here with me today someone you are going to want to hear about. Not only does he have an amazing story of how he got here, which he's going to tell us in a minute, but he has an amazing company that if you haven't heard of, you're going to want to know. And so meet Boris Bajan. And so two-time chronic illness conqueror, and you're going to hear all about this, <laughs> who at one point had seven different doctors, from medical doctors to energy healers, and became extremely frustrated, as many of us do and many of you do, with the shotgun approach applied to his health without real-time objective data. Leveraging his strong background in building and scaling companies, Boris set out on a mission to find out how we can understand the impact of our actions on our health accurately and in real time. From this mission, Theia Health was born, named after the Greek goddess of insight, symbolizing the new era of the healthcare that he is building. Boris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for that great intro. Much appreciated. Every time you hear an intro, don't you go, is that me? <laughs> seriously yeah i'm like <laughs> how I does that mean even... yeah right? exactly exactly love it yeah i know i feel we uh, so many people and they're like it's not even me you're reading all these things i don't even know who that is yeah well and so i do want you to dive in because i have mm -hmm. read into your childhood the diagnoses <laughs> the whole and the story is amazing and yeah. i mean i want to start there because that is yeah. that is why you are where you are sitting with me today so let's yeah. start there and, and let's share that Sounds good. So we're going to go back to the age of seven, good old seven years old. And at that time, I had lots of health issues. You know, they were trying to diagnose me what's going on. I was going to these, you know, weird like places where you kind of hang out and all these doctors do strange things to you. And it, it sounds creepy. And it was. And after all of that, <laughs> you know, I got diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease. Sorry. Mm -hmm back up. I got, uh, I got diagnosed with asthma at that time mm -hmm. and they gave me the puffers. You know, I was a cool kid in school with the puffer immediately. And they just said, this is something that's for life. There's nothing really you can do. Don't even try, et cetera. And so two years later, kind of fast forwarding quickly, I was off the puffers. There was no asthma diagnoses. I was doing the breathalyzer test they had me doing for years. Mm -hmm. I was scoring above most kids my age and I was playing soccer every day. Yep. And so it was it was this like internal shock to the body of, well, hang on a second. I don't understand how could I have turned myself around and gotten better with without any interventions. And so that probably sparked like a huge curiosity in me, also a frustration of well, what what's not adding up here? Like one plus one is not equaling two, and why is that? And and how is that possible? So going into my later years, you know, I was playing varsity basketball, really healthy, working out all the time. Got really into nutrition, most likely because I was sick when I was growing up. So I always kind of mm -hmm. had this subconscious level of taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. And the irony is. I kind of gave it away, but in my early 20s, I get diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease because I got really sick again. And I always like to joke, like if you get one chronic disease and battle through it, why? Like it should be a universal law that that's not acceptable that, twice. <laughs> right. That now it's over and you're good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so jokes aside, I lost 50 pounds in less than three months. 
Wild. And I'm 6'4". And mm-hmm. so I have the complete opposite problem of what most people have, which is when I gain weight, nobody notices. When I lose even a pound, everyone's like, well, you know, you're skinny. And it's like, yeah. hang on. <laughs> you know, why is this so unfair? And I can't relate to anybody because most people have the opposite problem. But when I lost 50 pounds, it wasn't a what's going on. It was, are you dying? Are you in your breath dead? Like it was just, yeah. you know, people's reaction was so visceral. I didn't even want to see people because it was so embarrassing mm-hmm. to have that reaction and then not really know what to tell them. Right. And when I was diagnosed, you know, they did all these tests and it got so bad that my large intestine to my small intestine, like that, that connection was almost completely closed because there was so much scar tissue there. And I, I remember because I was doing this one test where you could kind of see what's going on internally, almost like ultrasound, but more advanced. Yeah. And I could just see like black sludge in my intestines. And I was trying to get the technicians to give me an answer. And they're usually not allowed to. Mm-hmm. And one of them was basically alluded to saying, this is just not good. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. don't think that this is normal, essentially. And I walked away from that diagnosis. They had scheduled me for a pre-operation, you know, come pre-ops, let's take a look. Everything was on the table. Take out your intestines, cut it out a little bit, whatever the case mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And this time around, I had more experience. I was older. I had already studied nutrition and I knew that, you know, I'm going to do one of two things here. I'm either going to die trying to get better or, you know, basically have this disease take over me and I'm dead anyway. Yeah. And it was an aggressive approach because I had, you kind of mentioned a lot of doctors, but I had an MD, two gastroenterologists. I had a naturopathic doctor, a functional medicine doctor. I had an energy healer. I had a Chinese herbalist. I was going to yoga, I was working out, I was doing cardio, I was reading every book. And that sounds like that would be awesome, or this is the the way to do it. And obviously, it was some way to do it. But the the biggest frustration was everything was contradicting itself. So, you know, one Mm -hmm. doctor would want me on an aggressive biological drug to to kind of just kill my immune system. And then another one would want something less, you know, something more yeah. proven, a lot less invasive. Mm-hmm. Others would want me eating all the time. Some would want me fasting, you know, oatmeal is good. Oatmeal is bad for the gut. <laughs> Veggies are good. You know, so it's like, there yeah. was no way to make a good decision because even everybody who meant well, just had some philosophy that they're like, this is probably it or not. Mm-hmm. And I want to put into context for everybody listening in my position with my intestines almost closed every meal that I went towards, I had one thing in my mind, there's a 50% chance I end up in the hospital throwing up for 16 hours on IVs. So if I'm going to eat this, I have to risk that there's a 50% chance it's going to end up very badly for me. Yeah. On the flip side, if I don't attempt this optimization or, or, you know, thing to to get me better, I will never get better. So you, you're, you're almost stuck in a place of, extreme anxiety over what decision you're going to make not knowing going into that decision and not really knowing afterwards you're kind of just hoping that over time you get better and things will stabilize and so that itself wasn't good because you guys are fdns and or you know you're on you're on the human optimization podcast i'm sure there's things that are talked about here all the time with, Mm -hmm. with regards to how you view your food or even how you approach things, they're going to digest better or worse, right? Yeah. So I'm trying not to have anxiety, knowing the math and making decisions off all these resources that I'm spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, some, you know, it added up over time to lots of money. And that was the hardest part about the disease or, or my illnesses was that I had no idea what to do or how to do it. And I had to experiment. And most resources around Crohn's and IBD, I, you know, I'll just say it's they're, they're terrible because all these groups that I joined, every single one of them was basically saying, there's nothing you can do for you kind of, you should just self-loathe in the corner and try to maintain it until you just de- de- depreciate over time. Wow. I was like, well, how is that motivating? Like who is supposed to get better at with that type of advice, right? Mm-hmm. And so I rejected, I basically would join groups and just leave. And then I was like, I'm just going to do this myself because clearly no one's on my side here for some, for one reason or the other. Yeah. 
and going all the way, you know, the next two years were kind of rough, but the way I was looking at if I'm getting better or not is do I have, are my hospital visits, not that I'm not going to a hospital. I'm like, <laughs> I didn't know I'm going to end up in the hospital, but are the visits longer and longer between them? You know? So if it was like every once a week, is it now every two weeks? Is it every month that I'm ending up in the hospital? And that was my main barometer because feelings are fleeting. You know, you could feel good in a second. You could feel bad. Your energy shifts. You're never in a really good state because, yeah. you know, you're, you have no nutrition in you and there's, there's tons of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the way I was looking at it. And so after those two years, I've never, ever, ever once ended up in the hospital ever again. I was able to travel the world went through Southeast Asia, eating spicy food from wow. food vendors on the street, which was like the, I think that would be the epitome of what you're not allowed to do, <laughs> you know, with that type of diagnosis. I think you're right. <laughs> and so it was just this, like, I, you know, I've talked to people who had these stomach issues. I'm like, I can eat a whole pizza, nothing, no organic ingredients, nothing. And I will be okay. Like I won't mm -hmm. end up in a hospital. I'm not going to feel, I'll feel crappy because you ate a whole pizza anybody mm -hmm. would but i wouldn't have this like crazy flare-up etc and the the kind of nail in the coffin there was uh my last colonoscopy i bet my doctor who was a gastro i said you're i'm gonna get off every medication every supplement whether you want me to or not he said mm -hmm. i'll only allow it he got to this point but he was battling me i'll only allow it if you do a colonoscopy and everything looks good Mm -hmm. And so I remember that colonoscopy. I woke up, he came, handed me a sheet of paper and said, you're free to get off all drugs. Uh, wow. And it said hundred percent disease free on that paper. And I was like, part of me was deadly scared because, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know I feel better, but do you really want to know the science or like, do I really want to know what's in there? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was, it was a, it was a, sigh of relief but also a big panic moment because i was like ah if there's something there then i you know i'm not there yet etc and so that was kind of my second go around of how you know healing myself the first time was more random it was just put in a new environment and healed the second yeah. time was extremely aggressive and over the top approach that you know i didn't know what, what way it would pan out but i was like i'm willing to try every day one more time and so that one panned out. And so now uh, I'm at a point where I was like extremely frustrated with medicine and healthcare because nothing made sense to me. Nobody was really able to help. Mm -hmm. And that that has stuck with me for the rest of my life. So I always look to help others in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And and so I know I know as well, you know, thinking even about the business that you're in now, and mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. You went through a lot of growth from a business perspective too, right? As you figured yeah. out what life, what you wanted your life to be all about. So share a little bit on that. I always think that's an interesting, that's an interesting journey as well from self-realization. Yeah. You know, I've had a lot of these conversations with people who were in similar positions, who are in similar positions, were a little bit better, worse, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they always want to know, like, give me the exact diet combination of herbs, supplements that you did. I'm like, it's not going to help you, you know? So I, and I've done this consulting. And so then they always go back to, well, if I need to experiment, you know, I'm like, sure, I can probably cut your learning curve a little bit mm -hmm. just because I tried so many things. But then it came back to, well, how did you get out of that by yourself? And I mm -hmm. always go back to, I'm like, it's a little bit woo-woo out there, et cetera, but, and corny it could be, but at, at the same time, it's true where it's like, you need to believe that you can. Mm -hmm. And if you, yeah. if you have that as your standard, then uh, you need a goal that you also want to go towards, right? Or something to go away from or, or all three. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, look, I know what I want my life to look like. I want to be a successful businessman. I do want to travel the world. I want mm -hmm. to live to the fullest. And so I'm not going to let the disease stop me. I'm going to work every day, you know, not stupidly. Like if I can't get out of bed, I can't get out of bed. But I'm like, that doesn't mean I don't try the next day. Yeah. And so realistically, if you break down the mechanics of the, that belief and those goals, what it allows you to do is you try that experiment, no matter, no matter if there's that 50% chance one more time, 
every single day. Right. So I'm like, it was just that in two years, I probably did more repetitions of experiments. And I was putting this in journals and stuff like that than anybody else who's done it over 20 or 30 years. Like I just condensed the amount of times I was willing to try it and it, and it sucks. Sometimes mm -hmm. it didn't suck. And now I was like, okay, great. There's a data point. But my motivation to try one more time was so high that I did it. And so eventually you just find things that you're like, okay, this is now a staple, like it's mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. This is now doing okay. You know, this is at least, if this is a placebo, I also didn't care, right? Like people always latch on to things. Mm -hmm. I was like, doesn't matter. If you tell me this, that it's going to help me and it's a placebo a hundred percent, I still feel better. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yep. put yourself in your own shoes and think about it and go, why do I care about who who's able to help me? It could be a witch doctor. I was, I actually had a witch doctor <laughs> that people coined a witch doctor, you know? And like, I paid for all these things, but I was like, as long as I believe that it's going to work or I'm mm -hmm. open to that concept of something else can work, then why not try it? And, and I think that, you know, probably a lot of it didn't, wasn't necessarily not, at least not all at once, but it, it was the notion of, I need to believe in myself. Mm -hmm. I don't take your opinion as fact. I want to do all these things in my life. So how do I move towards those? And that was always my thought, right? And I think yeah. the the last kind of call out is a lot of people that are sick that I knew or that were trying to get better, they would always talk about their problems. I feel tired. I feel sick. I, you know, yeah, you're sick. <laughs> That's, you're <laughs> like, this shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> yeah. You know? I'm yeah. like, I, I, this is obviously true, but it, the more you're focusing on that, the more you're making it true versus like, okay, what's the one more thing I could try? Or like, what's the dream vacation that I want? Mm -hmm. Okay. If that's true, like, how do I make it happen? And then you're just thinking in a different way. Right. And so that's like the, the very basics of like, you need those things for it to mechanically work this way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes total sense. And so, and you're right, because what did work for you might not work for everybody else either, depending on how the, did, we're all different. Lifestyles are different. The stress is yeah. different. The condition is, is, you know, maybe not exactly the same as well. So there's always little nuances like that. For sure. And so, so kind of going down that business road, you mm -hmm. had a, a, a eye opening journey there too, before you got kind of into being, you know, even considering finding a partner, right? Finding a yeah. founder mm -hmm. and then opening uh, Thea. Yes. So business was interesting because in my 20s, I built, you know, I, I've been building businesses for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And in my 20s, I, my one criteria was I want to be able to work from anywhere. So I started yep. internet businesses, mm -hmm. which was a great bet, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had some good foresight into like, this will allow me to travel, but I, you know, I don't have to be physically somewhere. Yep. And so that's led to me being exposed to like, how does the internet work? How do you build an online business? So I got into marketing, then I got into ad technology. So like, I understood, mm -hmm. Hey, this is how marketing online works, but then the technology that's tracking it, and during COVID, I had a kind of heart to heart with myself and said, hey, I'm, I'm part of these three businesses, cool businesses, great people, like nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But the one question that I asked, which kind of cut every all the noise out was if I woke up today and those businesses didn't exist, would I care? And the yeah. answer was no. So I'm like, man, I really don't care about these businesses. And I'm not saying like the clients or the team. I'm just saying like that type of business didn't yep. excite me. Mm -hmm. And so... Then I thought to myself, okay, well, what do I want to do then in the next 10 years or 20 years? And it didn't have to be an exact business, but mm -hmm. I was like, what missions or big visions do I have that I want to align around? Because I knew it would take some time to, I was part of three businesses. So it took mm -hmm. some time to transition out and make, mm -hmm. and make that move. Uh, so I spent probably four months just researching and I always came back to one thing that's always been on my mind, probably since the age of seven, and now that you know my story, yeah. which is I really, you know, I all this ad technology and advertising online, it's almost perfect. I'm like, I know exactly what you've done on my site. I know how long you were there. I know how many links you clicked. I know how many emails you mm -hmm. opened. I know your intent of buying if it's high or low. Mm -hmm. Like that's tremendous technology. And, and then I go back to when I was sick twice, 
I had no technology to give me insight onto my body. And I'm like, but it's so amazing in this other aspect. Is there a way that we could know when we do something, what's the impact? Mm -hmm. And that's, I always came back to that idea. And so doing that research for four months, I finally stumbled upon biosensors or more specifically continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. And my brain went on fire because I was like, hang on. We finally have a biomarker that's directly tied to your metabolic health, which is all of your health. Mm -hmm. And we can get it in an always on manner. So I was like, when I was eating or experimenting with diets, fasting, doing herbs, I could see what my body, how it's responding. Mm -hmm. So I've had this idea probably since the age of seven. And it wasn't until there was hardware invented where I saw an opportunity of building something where we could action. Hey, I did this put this thing in my body or I reacted to my environment in some way. What's my body saying? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, is it okay? Is there a room for improvement, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, and then once, once I started testing the hardware, I quickly realized, Hey, this hardware was really meant for a medical device company dosing medicine, i.e. insulin for diabetics. Right. But the data is so much better than that. Like you can get so many things if you just correlate what else is going on. And you don't have to be diabetic. You could be anybody. So our our goal was let's figure out a way to use this data. And my future, you know, the way I'm betting my future now, before it was get on internet businesses. Now it's bet on bio data and actioning your personal data becoming a norm in the next 10 years. So yeah. really what we did then was we said, okay, what if, you know, I went back to when I was sick, what did I want? I wanted my care providers, my coaches, everybody to know what's going on. So I don't have to go to a meeting and show them 15 pages of notes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then leave the meeting with <laughs> just paying for telling them about my notes. <laughs> But second, you know, when I'm doing something, let's see what's going on. You know, I would love to know. And then how do I correlate that? And then what, you know, what are my moving averages over time, et cetera. So we built an app that, you know, a practitioner could take, sell to their clients, mm -hmm. the data would stream between them. And then everybody knows what's going on and it's very transparent. So that mm -hmm. was really the starting point of how we came up with the idea and why. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. So, and this all kind of ties back into the CGM, right? Correct. Okay. So client has a CGM on, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just explain, can you explain just with the hardware mechanism, how does that all work? Like, yeah. What, just, I, I know people are, are probably going to be wondering about that. Because I yeah. know some people always ask, well, does it hurt? Does it, I'm like, well, no, it just, <laughs> right. So but, to, let's talk For about sure. the hardware. So the hardware, we, did, we didn't invent hardware, but we're using other people's hardware. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so the, basically the way it works is, you know, you work with a provider and they say, hey, let's get bio data so we can mm -hmm, see, mm -hmm. you know, the care plan, how it's working. Yep. And you buy through that provider. Thea does all the backend work. So we write mm -hmm. a prescription because they're prescription only devices. Yep. We ship it to that client's house. Mm -hmm. We give them instructions and guide them on how to put them on. Mm -hmm. They are literally like two pennies stacked together. That's how big it is. Wow. Uh, it does pierce the skin. Mm -hmm. People think it's a needle. It's not a needle. It's actually a filament. Mm -hmm. So a filament is something that's bendy. So that when you're moving around, you don't feel anything. And it's right. five millimeters. So it's like literally, tiny, you can't tiny. even see yeah. Like if I showed you right now, you wouldn't see it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. When it's when it's in there, the data starts streaming to our app, mm -hmm. and then the client can log their food and activities, meditations, That's feelings, amazing. whatever they want to log, mm -hmm. and then we give them a score. Like how did your how did your body respond to that input? And the input mm -hmm. doesn't actually matter, right? Like it can be, essentially you could like we've had people who are like, I'm getting a haircut. Let's see how that did for my metabolic health, and we're like. Yeah. <laughs> probably fine it's a haircut <laughs> but it was the intrigue of i just want to see what types of events do to my body and how do they right. interact with me uh, and so once that data is there and and people are logging their activities and getting mm -hmm. those scores we send those back to the provider or the pra 
practitioner who's who's catering the, the care plans. Mm -hmm. And now the, you know, the provider can look either in real time or run reports and look at and say, hmm, you know, Boris should be doing a little bit better this week. Maybe I reach out or we should push his meeting in and let's see what's going on. Maybe he fell off the bandwagon or yeah. even in real time, be like, hey, this these foods are not working. You know, let's mm -hmm. switch those out before we even meet. So there's just a tremendous amount of things you can do now because everything's transparent between the two parties mm -hmm. and you can feel confident both the provider and the, the end user in terms of like how something is going and do we need to adjust it. That's amazing. And I'm assuming that uh, the end, so the end user doesn't have the data until the practitioner presents it to them. Is that correct? Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, no, everyone has the data at all times. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay. Even yeah. better. So, yeah. then they... so when you're logging, you'll see in real time That's amazing. what's going on. Wow. And therefore you could hit up your provider and say, Hey, yeah. you know, I had two bad days or I had two great days, you yeah. know, maybe we so now it's just, everyone has the data and everyone mm -hmm. has the scoring and we mm -hmm. made it simple to understand because the one thing that I knew that would be you know, let's say we had to teach people how to read glucose and yep. then interpret how to, how the scores work. And then no, now we're getting into, nobody wants to do that. They just want to know, am I, am I doing the right things? <laughs> if yes, I want to keep going. Yeah. If no, what, how do we improve them? That's mm -hmm. it. Right. So yep. that, that's where a lot of the work went into. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And so with regards to what about, um, I'm curious, just on average, like, is this something that people use for long periods of time throughout protocols? Like, mm -hmm. do they, do the hardware need to be replaced? Like, how does all that work as well? Yeah, it's dependent on use case. Okay. So if you're really sick, yeah, you're going to use it for a longer period yeah. of time, right? Yeah. Just because, mm -hmm. look, it's going to take some time. You know, for me, yeah. it took two years and like, sure, I was getting it probably took six months when mm -hmm. I was sick just to be like, okay, I think I'm on some path here. That's making some sense. Yeah. But really it took two years. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's like, if you, if your body took a beating for years, which most of the time, that's the reason it, it starts to show you signs, yeah. then it's probably going to take equal amount or, you know, maybe not as much, but like mm -hmm. some amount of time. Yeah. So, you know, when there's somebody who's like a type two diabetic, it might take a while for them to get out of those ranges. If somebody yeah. is, you know, we've had a lot of pregnant women, I'll just give some use cases, like yeah, pregnant women want to use it. So they're like, what's going on with my metabolism, my blood sugars during my pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If I can avoid being gestational diabetic during my pregnancy, you know, great. Because there's repercussions around that. It's like, how do we optimize our day? Then we have people that are professional athletes working mm -hmm. with concierge medicine clinics who just want a 1% improvement all the time. And yeah. that's what they're looking for, right? So the use cases definitely depend. Mm -hmm. We always tell people and practitioners, we really see the data. And if you do it for at least three months, it's super impactful. Mm -hmm. Only because when you first start, you're you're kind of wanting a baseline that first two weeks, right? You don't actually want to start optimizing day one because mm -hmm. you're going to fudge the data. You yeah. want to be like, how am I really doing? Like just mm -hmm. without intervention, like my decisions that I make. And then you're probably going to start doing one or two experiments. So that would, you know, that's like your first 40 to 50 days. So once you can get like five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 experiments over three months, Mm -hmm. You can also look now and see how is my trend line doing? You know, if it's improving consistently, you probably got a bunch of learnings there and you might not need to do it if you're a healthy individual any longer. Yeah. Uh, and then it comes down to personal preference after that. You know, we've had people that tried it, love the accountability, mm -hmm. love knowing what's going on. So they keep doing it. Others are like, yeah, I got what I needed, you know, healthy individual. Uh, maybe they do it every quarter just to kind of check in. So yeah, yeah. it does depend. And then the last part of your question is, do they need to be replaced? They do currently. Uh, so they last 14 days. Mm -hmm. So you would need two a month to, to complete a month. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay. So that makes sense. And so you said currently, now I'm curious. <laughs> What is that? Yeah. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> so we are talking to multiple companies mm -hmm. that are looking to come out with non-invasive rechargeable solutions. 
Oh, interesting. So okay. you would put them on, take them off, charge them like a phone yeah. or a or an aura ring. Wow. And then put them back on. And so we're excited. And it's also non-invasive, meaning like it doesn't prick the skin. Right. So we're really looking forward to working with those. Companies. I'm already in talks with a lot of them where it's nice. like, how do we get that tech? And this is why I was saying the future is looking really bright for us getting data on ourselves and making those mm -hmm. decisions yeah. because I know the tech that's coming and, yeah. you know, we, we just position ourselves as we'll work with any company or any brand that makes that easier. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, our whole focus is the software to make that easy to understand for the provider and user. Right. Yeah. Makes total sense. That's amazing. And you know what there, when you think about gathering data for your own body, like how empowering is that, right? Exactly. <laughs> it, just to know what you're doing, how that's affecting you and, and, and then allowing you and even, you know, kind of continuously educating ourselves about some of these things that are affecting us that we don't even realize, right? Exactly. That is, uh, that's amazing information. And so how, t let, let's share with just how does the practitioner bring this into practice, into their practice with their clients or their patients? How do they do that? What's the process? Yeah, it's super simple. They sign up through our website mm -hmm. and they, we usually get back to them within 20 to 48 hours if they're approved or not. So mm -hmm. our internal team vets everybody to make sure, hey, are they actually a practitioner? You know, are they servicing clients? We try to get people who are pretend <laughs> to get in the system yeah. mm -hmm. just to keep it high quality and make sure, you know, we're catering to people actually helping people. Yeah. So that's probably 48 hours. Once you're approved, there's like an onboarding and company setup where we mm -hmm. walk you through how to use the data, how to look at the data, what the client experience is, mm -hmm. which plan you want to be on. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also give a co-branded landing page to all of our partners. Amazing. Meaning it's your own link that you can use to send to patients. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we have people that are selling it as part of their program mm -hmm. or package. So you can invite users and pay for them as well. So we made it very versatile so that we can plug into any any type of practice that that's looking yeah. to have it. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So that's definitely got lots of options behind it too for the provider as well, which is great. Exactly. Tell us just before, uh, before we sign off, I would love to hear, cause I am sure that you have many to share, but what would be one of a success story just with regards to the use of this specific tech that you have come across that just kind of really made your day? So I'll give, I'll give two examples, sure. one on the client user side, one on the yeah. provider side. Okay. The metric that we closest track in terms of, are we doing a good job with users is mm -hmm. we say zero to aha moment, like how fast can we get a user to their aha moment, their first mm -hmm. one. And it's within seven days of use. Wow. hundred percent of the time almost. And that to me is the metric that I love because yep. It's, it means that pretty much everybody that has come through our platform has had at least one moment of, I had no idea that my body's responding that way when I thought, so I thought this was like this and I'm not yeah. going to use good or bad. I thought this mm -hmm. was going to do this, but it mm -hmm. did this. Wow. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, some of the best use cases or things that I, that I'm most kind of interested in and didn't think would be the case we're getting almost as many people having reactions that are showing, you know, abnormal or high or too low on non food related things. And then understanding now that, Hey, stress actually impacts my body. You mm -hmm. know, like it's one of those things where you say, Oh yeah, I know stress is bad for you. But when you're like, what, you know, I'm, I'm on a 24 hour fast. Mm -hmm. Why is my body going nuts? And you know, then we'll dig in or we'll have user calls. And then they're like, yeah, I was having a, a feud with my mom or I was, you know, mm -hmm. I was angry at the news. I'm like, well, look at how it impacted you yeah. physiologically. And they're like, wow, I never put that two and two together. But it's like, yeah, because nobody could prove it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's hard to prove. You can't just say, oh, this is negatively impacting you. They're like, well, prove it. Right. So yeah. uh, and then 
that that was that's been probably like we're getting a lot of people who just are waking up to the fact that everything impacts you and it's not just food like if you're just eating mm -hmm. crappy food you know it's bad for you like we don't have to tell you that right mm -hmm. it's it's okay well how bad and then holy what do i do about it right Th those are the things and how do i plan better on the provider side we integrated with a with a big practice and they're mm -hmm. probably sending 500 sensors a month now with us because they made us part of their program like mm -hmm. their yep. program mm -hmm. now uses biodata powered by thea mm -hmm. uh, and when i talked to the the owner of that practice she told me that adherence to the plan has skyrocketed amazing because she was like when i used to tell people this is gonna perform this way in your body same mm -hmm. thing yeah but really is it gonna do that for me you know mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm probably fine and then when they're seeing it they're like oh like you are like, not joking like this is extremely stressful in the body or it's you know it's it's putting a tremendous amount of strain on me and I think the 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 reason the insights are so apparent is because bodies also adapt. So mm -hmm. you're like you feeling crappy. Like when I was really sick, I probably felt normal. Like I was like quote unquote right. normal. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, this is just how I feel. And now that I feel better and I'm and I get sick, I'm like, man, imagine I felt this way every day. I'm like, you did, remember? And you're like, I forgot. So it's just this way of like, oh man, like I had no idea what is actually going on and this plan is really working and she's right. So I better stick to it. Yeah. Uh, and that was like a huge win where I said, okay, you know, we have something special here and we got to make sure we do the right things to keep it that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. And two wonderful uh, examples just from both aspects of things. And I could see... I could see as well just those aha moments because I think we do move through days sometimes where, you know, yeah, stress is stress, but for someone to actually realize in real time how much that's actually impacting them on a real level, mm -hmm. like that's amazing. Yes, yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I, I always go back to it's one thing to empower but the it's the empowerment is going to go away in the next hour when you're hungry yep but it's another thing to to be able to know and understand what to do next right exactly. and i think that's the that's where like the, the true magic happens is if you're if you're clear on what what to do next you might still make the wrong choice mm -hmm. but over time you're training yourself to understand better and then make right choices exactly yeah and then and that's the amount of time 21 days to build a habit Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Boris, for joining us. This was eye opening and enlightening, and I can't wait to dive in and <laughs> and give this a try because I know that I just feel like this is such a huge piece of data that could be a missing link for so many providers mm -hmm. um, being able to have clients kind of stay on track. I think it's really important. And so We'll have all the links in the description for Thea Health. It's theahealth.ai. And obviously it's for providers only. So if you do have patients or clients that you treat and want to bring this on board, it's a perfect opportunity for you to dig in and learn a little bit more. And yeah, Boris, thanks for sharing your story. That was really inspiring, enlightening, you know, just, and then what you've created and your mantra for the next kind of decade of what you want to bring into the system is super empowering as well. So I just want to say thanks for all the work you're doing. It's amazing. I appreciate the kind words. And yeah. honestly, you had such great questions that you, <laughs> you drew out of me some of the things that I wasn't even thinking about. Oh, well, good. Well, that, that makes me happy. <laughs> well, thank you for spending time with us today. For those of you watching on YouTube, subscribe to my channel. There's a brand new episode every couple of weeks and give this episode a thumbs up. If you're listening on your favorite podcast host, make sure you give this episode a like and we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Human Optimization Podcast. Episode technical production is by Grace Sylvester and guest booking by Stu Tate. Want to learn more? Visit lisapatelkilla.com for incredible free resources to supercharge your journey to becoming the best version of you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe to the Human Optimization Podcast and follow me on social media at Lisa Patelkilla.